Welcome back to part three of the Stratocaster Partscaster build, a show that so far has been incredibly successful. In fact, so much so, I think it's going to outstrip Oppenheimer and Barbie combined. But in all seriousness, thank you so much for your support. Um, please subscribe if you can. If you can't, you're doing something wrong because you can. Anyway, here's part three. Time to get some sanding done. <laughs> And there we have it. This is the first coat of the Olympic white and I'm really happy with this. Uh, it's looking fabulous. I'm just gonna spray it with a bit of water and um, go over it with a little bit of 400. And I'm gonna do this very, very gently because I really should be waiting a lot longer before I do this. But I'm too excited and I just wanna get on with it. That's looking lovely. Right, I think that's enough for now. And with that, I shall go and have my evening meal and let this dry off. Now that's wonderful. Very much uh, looking forward to seeing all of this assembled because that is the beginning of how it's gonna look. As I say, I want to do a bit of uh, relicking on this. It's sort of relicking, but sort of not relicking. It's more of a stylized thing. I'm hoping to scrape away some of this white, go through the primer underneath and into some of the colors that you saw me spray on the body earlier. That way I hope to get this sort of dappled look, which looks like it's been resprayed multiple colors, multiple different times. Don't know why. It's just an idea. It may fail. If it fails, I should be stripping all this off again and doing something else. Now, I don't want you to fret about this, obvious pun, but a lot of people get very nervous about this. And I'm sure a lot of you have seen me do this at least twice before in two previous videos, but let's go over it again. It's not complicated. It's not difficult and anyone can do it. You don't necessarily need one of these, but it's nice if you've got one, you can do it with a hammer, but I use a fret press as well. I'll show you both methods. First thing we need to do is to take our fret wire, and this is Fender style, uh, what we, we call banjo fret wire, which is very thin uh, fret wire. It's about two millimeters. I don't know what that is in foreign, but you can look it up. Chop it to length. Now you can go through and chop all of these pieces of wire to length before you uh, crack on the start. I prefer to do it as I go along. And as I've said before, I do that because I get bored. So there we go, that's chopped to length. Now what you optionally can do once again is you can take a pair of these nippers, which I've adapted from a pair of standard ones. You can buy them on Stumac and places like that already adapted, but uh, it's a very simple method to adapt these just by putting a slot in the top. And you just knock off about a quarter of an inch or less of each end so that basically the T-shape doesn't go all the way to the end of the fret. Pick up your fretting hammer and give it a tap at either end. Now, if you're carrying on with the hammer, all you need to do is just go across it with the hammer and tap it into place. Once you're happy that it's in place, you prune off the ends. And I do them at a little bit of an angle because I know at some point I'm gonna put a bit of an angle on it. So I might as well steal a lead on that. And that is our first fret in place. You just continue like that for the other 20 on this neck, 21 frets. Um, but I use a fret press, which literally means there's an extra step here where I put it on here where I've got a, a pre-manufactured curved die to the correct radius and I just squish it down and that has seated it correctly. I'm just going to give it an extra little squeeze. Now you don't want to go too far with this. This is a one ton arbor press. So if you give it too much, you can actually squeeze the fret into the fretboard. You do not want to squash the fret into the fretboard. And there it is, fret one done. Carry on like that and do the rest. That'll be nice. 
this. Tying off that end. Tying off that end. Stick it onto the other press. Squish it in. So here we have a beautifully fretted neck. The only problem is that these sides are absolutely deadly. I mean, I, I can barely bring myself to touch these sides. These are like razor blades. So we also need to knock those off. And what I've got is a, a well-known accessory. It's basically just a wooden block with a file set into it with a nice angle here. And what we do is we just run that up and down the neck. and that takes the sides of the frets off so that we can handle it without um, damaging ourselves. Now it's inevitable just because we've been using a sharp implement on a beautifully finished neck that we will knock some of that finish off because we're trying to round these frets over. It's one of the things that makes working on maple necks so tricky. So all I do is I just take a, a rag when I've finished that process, dip it in some of my vintage amber dye that I've mixed up and run it down over those bits of wood that I've exposed and immediately they disappear. So that's finished. We need to go on to the next stage which is going to be shaping the frets. Nice one. Unexpectedly, I find myself at uh, Wentworth uh, at the PGA Golf Championship. Um, not something I planned. I was planning on doing some more fretting. But unfortunately, poor old Mr. McElroy seems to be doing all the fretting at the moment. But it's lovely to be here. My life is bigger than guitar making, as I'm sure yours is. But it's lovely to do something like this every now and again. So when your best friend says to you, do you want to go to see the PGA Golf Championship? You sort of decide, yeah, OK, and the fretting can wait. So anyway, back to the guitar building at uh, the other side of this cut. But before we go on, I just wanted to talk to you about protection. You can't go waving your tools around without consequences. So before you go on and start crowning those frets, have a look around for all those bits of fret ends that came off and pick up any tools that are lying around, anything that can touch the neck of the guitar and potentially ruin it, because it will. Great story from my college lecturer, used to keep his chisels above his bench because it was really handy. He went up to pick one up one day, it fell out of his hand, went straight through the top of the beautiful D28 Martin guitar that he was working on. Horrendous. You know, it's like Alec Guinness in Star Wars. Millions of voices suddenly cried out and were silenced. I fear something terrible has happened. And in the spirit of protection, before we go any further, what we must do is take this up. If we go trying to level these frets without taking this up, we're going to destroy this finish that we've spent so much time and so much agony putting on here. So let's take this up before we carry on. A really wicked tip that I was given was tape up the sides first. We can take these side bits off and the top strips will come off with it. So that's one side done. Okay, so that's the two sides done. The next thing I'm gonna do is tape across the frets and just get the tape on just up to the fret, just touching it. Take it down sides and just leave it nice and loose like that for now. Let's chop us another piece off there. And on the other side, same thing again up nice and close to the fret so that the fret is isolated and it's just a question of doing this and working your way up the neck putting this tape on as we go 
the next one might just fit in one piece and then we're going to have to switch to some thinner tape which of course I don't know where it is so the next bit I'm just going to have to cut the tape down the middle I've also seen people crease the tape so we could try that stick it on one side like that and then crease it and bring it up that also works there we go so one of the fender custom shop guys doing that doesn't look as nice but it seems to work Funny thing, the worst cut I have ever had in my life I got from a pair of these really strong, sharp Wilkinson sword style scissors. I was cutting a cable and I held it and I had a stray finger and I went straight through the cable and straight into my finger and I went straight into an ambulance. <laughs> it's, it's also a, a fact that the worst accident that I've ever had myself in this workshop was actually with a belt sander. Um, there's so many other tools that it could have been with. Uh, I guess it's going to happen at some point to almost everybody. Um, but the belt sander was not the one that I was expecting. Um, it being, you know, the least aggressive tool that one uses, or one of the least aggressive. But it just goes to show, you know, the moment you let your guard down, the moment you get complacent about your tools, that'll be when you get hurt. Boy, did it hurt. It's funny, cutting yourself is one thing, sanding yourself away is another. <laughs> and then the last piece, which I will have to chop in half. So there we are, we're all taped up and ready to go. But we're not quite ready to go because there's a really important thing that we must do first. We must make sure that this neck is absolutely straight. We can sight down it and do all that sort of thing. All nonsense. We have to check this with a straight edge. Essential piece of kit. Now if this isn't absolutely flat, we need to make it flat. And we do that by adjusting the truss rod screw at the end of the neck. Yours might be up here. Depends what sort of neck you've got but uh, you need to give it a quarter turn, just a quarter turn first, just to see what the effect is, recheck it, and keep adjusting it until it's absolutely flat and you can see that the straight edge is contacting with all the frets. You can also get these with notches in. They're very good. I don't use this one very much. I prefer to use it straight onto the top of the frets, but these you can actually contact with the fretboard and see that it's absolutely flat. To be honest, it's no use at this stage because I've put tape all over it, so it's going to probably make this inaccurate. But it's a nice check. Another tool. So now I know that the neck is absolutely flat, I'm going to mark up all the frets with a bit of blue felt tip, which will wear off when I use the levelling beam to level the frets. So let's mark them up. Just a little blue line across the top of each fret. It's interesting, as I'm actually putting the felt tip, the marker pen, across the top of the frets, I can feel how rough they are and how little scratches have appeared. Now, I'm going to have to clamp this down so that I can use the um, radius beam on it to flatten it. But when I clamp it, I'm going to have to be really careful that I don't put the neck under any torsion, any pressure to bend it. Otherwise, when I actually level it, I won't be leveling it at all. I'll actually be building in an error, and that's a catastrophic error, because the neck literally won't work properly thereafter. So we must clamp this very carefully. Welcome back to Philosophy Corner. And uh, this is not the corner of my workshop. This is the corner of a room in my house where I have some guitars. And all of these guitars I made. And I didn't make them from parts. They're not parts casters. They're made from blocks of wood. 
The reason I mention this is I got a very interesting message. The guy said to me, oh, well, if you're this formally trained luthier person, why are you building a guitar out of guitar parts? And I don't think he believed that I was actually capable of it. But it's a very good question and I thank him for it. There's a very simple answer. Parts casters and building from pre-prepared pieces, like necks and bodies, is the perfect way to get into the art of luthery. So what I decided to do to make my channel more interesting was to do a scratch build and then a parts caster. That way I think you cover all bases and hopefully you can show how you can move from parts casters to a scratch build. And you don't have to do that in one giant leap. You can do it by uh, building a body and adding a factory neck to it. And I think that once you've done that for a couple of guitars, you're probably ready to do a scratch build. I think it gives the channel more breadth of interest to a wider group of people. And that's all I'm really interested in, drawing more people in to doing what I enjoy so much and I believe that you can all do as well. Anyway, let's get back to the build. So this is my rig. This is how I set myself up ready for levelling. It's very important, I think, to support the whole of the middle of the neck so you don't get any whip or bounce. I've got a clamp which is merely holding it solid here and I have a clamp holding the clamp. And that's my setup. So, the moment of truth. Just put it nice and gently on the top and move it very gently backwards and forwards and immediately stop. And it Straight away you can see where it's contacting. It's contacting here, here and here, not very much here, a lot there and a little bit here but not very much up this end. Straight away you get an idea of how these frets are sitting. I think they're probably uh, set up okay but it looks like I'm going to have to do quite a few strokes to get them all to the same level. So let's carry on. Just a few gentle strokes and then just have a look. Yeah, I can see there's a contact point here. It's very likely there's a high fret here and there. On here I've got some 250 stick it, which is just sandpaper, but it's very hard and uh, I love this stuff. Um, it does a really good job and we're getting there. now gone so I'm pretty confident that these frets are absolutely level the next step we need to shape the top of those frets because now we've ground them all completely flat and to do that I'm going to transfer to another vice you can probably hear that it's uh, raining so it's uh, that's the end of summer in the UK I'll try and talk above it Get yourself a felt tip and mark those frets up again. We need to mark all of them with that blue line across the top so that when we take our fretting tool, and there are a lot of different fretting tools, but whatever your favourite fretting tool ends up being, um, we'll need to take off material off of these frets and bring it to a new point. This is my Z file. This is an incredible tool. They're expensive but worth every penny in my view. And you just place it on the fret and work across it and immediately I can see that the sides of the fret are thinning down and that the line, the blue line in the middle is getting even thinner. The idea of the thin blue line is that you're minimising how much of this fret actually comes into contact with the string and therefore making the actual fret more accurate intonation wise. You don't want a big wide fret because you don't really know where it's making contact. So bringing it to a point like this assures that your intonation and your pitch of that fret is correct. So that I can see what I'm doing, I have to wear two pairs of glasses. I add to this another two diopters, which brings it up real close. 
It looks ridiculous, but it works, which of course is the story of my life. I saw a guy on the internet recently actually attached one of these to like an electric saw so it would go backwards and forwards. It looked mental, but he said it worked great. I find that difficult to believe, but <laughs> just to show what people will do the most amazing things. I guess if you're doing it all day, every day, having it motorized in some way um, uh, will help the process, but uh, I mean, this kind of works. I'm just going to put some more blue on there because I've actually managed to rub some of it off, I think, with my hand. Yeah. Anybody who did metal work at school might remember something called marking blue. We just managed to spill it everywhere. Kids. You might want to go and do something a bit more interesting because this takes a while. What's the chances I'll speed this up? As with anything, uh, as you do something more and more, your technique evolves. And what I've been doing recently is once I've got to this stage where I've got this tiny little blue line on every fret, I just go over the frets with a little bit of thousand grit just to get off the blue and also start the process of polishing. It also starts to help to uh, form the edge of the fret, these little bits around here, because these can get pretty vicious and we're going to be using a little file to get that off. But for now, I'm just going to go over it like this. And I'm going to go this way as well. Okay. That's good. The next thing I'm going to need to do is to round over these fret ends because I can feel they're still really fierce. This is a tiny weeny file. It's got some sort of uh, rounded side to it and a flat side to it. And then the edges, just the two sides, the flat sides are abrasive. But this rounded bit isn't and the flat bit isn't. So it enables me to get onto the fret and start doing this weird shaping thing that you may have seen elsewhere. You do this sort of rolling motion like this. And it just takes that little bit of nasty tang off the bottom and starts to shape the ends of the frets into the sort of like a rowing boat prow. The rounded bit is so that you can actually touch it right on the fretboard and roll over. It's not so critical here because we've got it taped up. I'm going to use the flat side which enables me to get a bit deeper and I'm just going to go over this direction and do my little rounding movement just to get these nasty sharp ends off. At the end of the day you just have to give these fret ends some individual attention with this tiny file. Um, time invested here really does make a difference. Some people do this as a job. I mean, my hand's already gone numb. Come on, blood. There we go. Okay. Now these are micro mesh pads. You can also get it in sheets as well. I don't like it, it hurts my hands. But I use these pads and they're absolutely fantastic. When you buy them, they come in a whole range of grades and the colours denote the grade. The only problem with that is, as you use them, the colours wear off. So very shortly after you start using them, you have no idea what grade you're using based on the colour. But of course, you can tell with your hands. So you just go through them and um, you'll soon find which is the most coarse. And it's obviously that one. So this one is the one that I will start with. And the way that I use it is literally just to go up and down the neck like this paying attention to the edges and the sides like this and you can see that the frets will go dull and then once they've gone dull you can start the magic the magic being when you work across them because when you work across them they start to shine 
Now with these heavier grades, I tend to start with a good old rub across them because I want to get rid of all the last vestiges of the deep gouges. Do it twice, go up and down the length once, go across once, second time down the length and then across for a second time. So that's one, second time, up and down the length, do the edges because you want those edges to nicely round over and this is quite abrasive like that and then across and as you go across they start to shine and it's wonderful and literally you just go up and down changing grades as you go buffing it up a little bit and now we can take off this protective tape now someone said to me <clears throat> as long as you put the side down first it should come off really easily um, oh that's that's coming off quite well it's an incredibly satisfying thing this Right, so if I lift one side like this, apparently I should be able to lift it all off in one go. Nah, I think the person that told me that was an optimist. I can see some bits I might need to clean up. Oh yeah. So there we are, shiny frets, all fretted up, ready to go. One of the things that we can really do with a handmade guitar that you can't do with a factory guitar is spend that sort of time and that sort of effort on the frets. In a factory, it simply isn't practical. But for us, we can go to town on these things and make them really quite special. So, job done. Let's move on. Of course, I said move on. I have no idea where I'm going. That's the door. All three of them. So that was part three um, of the Parts Caster Stratocaster build. Looking forward to part four coming up soon. Please subscribe and I'll see you soon. Keep building.